Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today, we're going to talk about mushroom identification. Um, I think it's really important if you're out foraging mushrooms, especially, to know how to safely identify them. And it makes it um, a lot more fun. First of all, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that I am not an expert. I'm not a mycologist. I did not study mycology in university. And this is just something I do for a hobby. And I really like this saying here, all mushrooms are edible, but some only once. So that's something that's really important to remember when we're um, forging that we don't wanna make mistakes. So what we're gonna cover in this lecture is mushroom anatomy, the parts of the mushroom that you want to pay particular attention to so that it's easier to identify them and the different mushroom types that are out there. Um, some examples from some of the more common families. We're gonna spend a lot of time on poisonous mushrooms because it's more important to learn those first for obvious reasons. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about edible mushrooms and about safety. So first of all, um, mushroom anatomy. So all mushrooms um, have a cap and um, they have some type of structure for disseminating their spores, <clears throat> which is how they reproduce. So they can be gills or they can be tubes or teeth or other things. Um, some of them have a ring or an annulus um, some of them, or most of them, have a stalk, also called a stipe. Um, they have a base of the mushroom, and then some of them may have a cup. Um, there may or may not be a tap root, and the part of the mushroom that is underground, that is kind of the whole tree of the mushroom, is called the mycelium. And so not everyone realizes that if you pick a mushroom, you're not going to kill the mushroom. You're not really picking the important part of the mushroom. And yes, it's the fruiting body, so it's important, but it's kind of like picking an apple on a tree. You're not gonna kill the tree if you pick the apple, it's just the fruit. So if you just think of a mushroom as a fruit, then you don't have to worry about picking them. Um, and sometimes you have to pick one if you wanna take it home and make a spore print, or of course, if you're picking them to consume them. One thing that you might find interesting, and some of you may already know this, um, if you're Trekkie fans, is that there's a uh, Star Trek Discovery TV show on right now, and the creators or the writers decided that they wanted to have a character called Stamets. Um, he's the science officer and the chief engineer, and he was named after the real Stamets, Paul Stamets, who is a very famous mycologist. Um, some of you or many of you have probably already heard of him. He's on the news very frequently. Um, pretty interesting guy. You can look him up and he, he even has his own YouTube channel and uh, he's uh, very interesting to listen to. Anyway, um, I don't get the TV channel that has the show, but I do have a brother and a sister-in-law who are big truckies and they inform me that there is a mycelial network in space that spaceships can travel along and that um, there is a spore drive that Stamets um, invented, I guess, and is using. So um, that's kind of cool, very creative. And you wonder what they were smoking when they came up with that plot. Okay, so these are the things that you wanna look at when you're identifying mushrooms. You wanna start with looking at the cap, which is the very top part the shape and the color and the texture. So for example, is it shiny and smooth or is it velvety? Does it have scales or hairs, um, that kind of thing. And um, you wanna look for a ring. So that is an identifying feature for some types of mushrooms. They don't all have them, but some do, and they may be firmly attached or they may be loose. They can maybe slide up and down on the mushroom. And then you want to have a look at the stalk. You know, some of them may be very uniform, top and bottom. Some of them may be bulbous at the bottom, or some of them may be more narrow and top-like at the bottom. And they may have different colors and they may bruise when you touch them. So when you squeeze them, they may turn blue. An example would be 
um, psilocybin mushrooms or magic mushrooms and the psychoactive chemical in them turns blue. So it's kind of interesting. Um, some of them may have a cap or a vulva. And um, if you're going to dig up a mushroom, you want to go deep enough that you don't accidentally break it off here and think that it doesn't have one because um, it's usually under the ground. And then when you're looking at the undersurface of the cap, does it have gills? Does it have pores? Does it have teeth? Um, these are all important things to look at. If it has gills, are they free or are they attached? If, you know, are they attached to the stem? Do they go down the stem? Do they kind of go up? Are they notched? Or maybe they only go part way down, not all the way down. And uh, if you want to make a spore print, because that's really important um, for differentiating some lookalikes, you take the cap home, um, you put it under uh, glass on a piece of paper. And um, I wouldn't recommend white paper because if it's a white spore print, you won't see it. So you might want to use aluminum foil or you might want to use um, an old CD case, which is a clear plastic, and then it'll be better um, able to tell the color of the spores. So they may be black or brown or peach or white uh, or pink violet, um, you want to you want to look at that. And that's especially important when you're a beginner. Now, I get people sending me pictures of mushrooms frequently. And if this is all they send me, I really can't tell them anything. So when you're taking pictures to send to someone for second opinion, or if you're going to maybe upload them onto Facebook, because there are a lot of ID groups, on Facebook that are very useful. That's how I learned a lot of my information. You want to give them lots of angles. So one from the top, one from the side, a gill, what I call a gill shot, right? They want to be able to see the gills and clearly and a cross section so they can see if the gills, you know, if they do have gills, how they attach to the stem or not attach at all. And if they bruise, um, there's a family of mushrooms called boletes. We'll get to that. Uh, soon, a lot of them change color when you touch them, so that's really important. If they have a smell, they may smell like fruit, like apricots or coconuts. They may smell like maple syrup. Yep, isn't that weird? There's a type of mushroom called candy cap that smells like maple syrup. They may smell disgusting or chemical or like dirt. Um, so you need to notice that. And then finally, where you found them. Were they growing from the grass or from ground or were they growing on a tree or near a tree? There are a lot of mushrooms that are very dependent on trees and they will only grow under or on a tree, a specific species of tree, a host tree. So that's an important clue as well to give people um, or if you're looking it up in a book. And it's especially um, important to notice all these little differences when you're trying to tell the difference between edible and lethal um, mushrooms. And this is obviously <laughs> a joke, but sometimes it can be, um, they can be subtle. So um, you need to be very observant. Okay, so there are many different types of mushrooms. I think a lot of us, you know, when we are beginners think that they all have gills, but they don't. Um, there are some that have veins rather than gills. That would be um, chanterelles or black trumpets as an example. Boletes have tubes. Um, polypores have little pores. Poly means many pores. Some of them form like crusts on logs. Some have teeth like a hedgehog and they're called hedgehog mushrooms. Um, and they can look like clubs and corals and can be squishy jellies. And you get the point, lots of shapes. So we'll start by talking about polypore mushrooms. Um, they don't have gills, they have pores. Doesn't really show up well on this picture, but when you have one in hand, you look carefully, there'll be all these little tiny holes. And um, most of them will grow from trees and most of them are shelf-like. So this is artist conch, and it's called that because artists will sometimes paint on them or they'll use a um, wood burning iron to produce these beautiful works of art. And we've seen that in gift shops, places, or people selling them online. Uh, these are two very common polypores as well. This one here on the right is called a Tinder um, polypore. And it's really cool because as the name suggests, you can scrape it with a knife and the powder lights easily with a spark. 
And you can also use it to carry your fire from place to place, which is really important if you don't have um, a lighter or matches, like in the, especially in the prehistoric times, um, they would use um, things like these tinder polypores to take an ember and move it from place to place. And uh, this is Iceman, Otzi, and um, he was found to have a tinder polypore on him. And interestingly as well, he had a birch polypore. Birch polypores are another mushroom that's very common. They look like this on top. They're kind of beige and kind of a lighter color underneath. They have a very unique smell, um, not really pleasant, uh, but not disgusting either. They are medicinal, so you can read up on that on your own, but they do have um, immune stimulating properties, which is pretty cool, and anti-cancer properties, which a lot of polypore mushrooms have actually. And something that's really neat too, is they have kind of like a skin surface and that can be used as a Band-Aid. So, you know, if you're ever out in the wild and you, and you cut yourself and you don't have Band-Aid and there are these um, birch polypores nearby, you could take, uh, cut a little rectangle of the skin and use that as a Band-Aid. And maybe that's why Otzi had this on him as well, perhaps because it's medicinal, but maybe he needed Band-Aids. Now, um, turkey tail, is one of my favorite polypores for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's really pretty. I mean, look at those colors, but it's also um, medicinal. And I am a scientist, I'm a veterinarian, so I'm interested in medicine. And this is a, a medicinal mushroom. And there are a lot of um, clinical trials or clinical studies that prove that. So being a scientist, when someone says something is medicinal, I'm like, yeah, show me the proof. And what we look to is what's called a clinical um, trial. So ideally it's what's called a double-blinded clinical trial where the researcher and the subject of their, um, this, their study doesn't know whether they're getting the real medicine or placebo. So, you know, they'll divide into two groups. You're getting the real one, you're getting the placebo and someone independent of the researcher knows who got what. And at the end of the study, you compare the results, you unblind it. And then if they are statistically significant in the real medicine group rather than the placebo group, then that's pretty convincing proof that it works. And so there have been clinical trials with, uh, with turkey tail. Um, one of them was done in women with breast cancer and they found that it um, extended their survivability. So um, it didn't cure them, but it made them more responsive to chemo and probably because it was stimulating their immune system and then the immune system was saying, seeing the cancer cells and going, oh, I'm gonna kill you, you don't belong here. Whereas maybe before the turkey tail, um, the immune system was run down from the cancer and not able to do that. They've also done a similar study in, um, in men with prostate cancer and then also in dogs with uh, cancer of the spleen called hemangiosarcoma. They found that the dogs that um, were given turkey tail live longer than the dogs that didn't. And hemangiosarcoma is a really bad tumor in dogs. So it's kind of nice to see that you have a, a substance that's found in nature and has no side effects at all, um, that is having some scientific benefit. And if you think of it, um, a lot of antibiotics um, have originally come from mold, right? Penicillin is from bread mold. So it's not surprising that you're gonna find substances in other fungi that have medicinal properties as well. This little picture shows that there's many different, um, we'll call them varieties of turkey tail. So there's the true turkey tail, and that's the one that's medicinal. It's very white on the undersurface and has pore. And false turkey tail can look very similar on top with these little you know, turkey-like colors, but underneath it's not white. It's kind of a yellowish color and you won't see pores at all. It looks very velvety and smooth. Some polypores have a maze-like undersurface, really pretty. And one cool thing about polypores is, you know, a lot of people think you're only gonna find mushrooms in the summer or the fall in the warm weather. And in the winter, you're not gonna find any. And that's not true at all, actually. <laughs> polypores especially, you can find year round. So. Because of them, you can go mushroom hunting in the winter and never be disappointed. Okay, I'm gonna talk now about a couple of edible polypores. 
And these are nice ones because they're what I call beginner mushrooms. They are very easy to identify and there are no poisonous lookalikes. So the first one is Dryad's Saddle or Pheasant Back and it's called that um, one, you know, this is a Dryad, a little fairy and someone imagine that she or he would be sitting on this little saddle like mushroom surveying the world. It's kind of a cute image. Um, and it's called a pheasant back because if you use your imagination, these markings are like feathers. Now, another thing that makes them easy to recognize is they smell like watermelon rind. It's very weird. Um, they usually flush in May, and we say flushing meaning blooming, or that's when you find them. So they're a seasonal mushroom, as are many mushrooms. And um, they're often found on elm trees. And if you're gonna harvest them for eating, you wanna get them when they look like this, kind of little buds, because they're very tender at this stage. Whereas when they're bigger and older, they're more like just a piece of cardboard and pretty well inedible. They're not gonna poison you unless they're rotten and then you're eating a decaying thing full of bacteria. But um, yeah, they're not gonna poison you because they're poisonous, just because they give yourself food poisoning. Which by the way, I think a lot of people, um, that are poisoned with mushrooms do it because they eat raw mushrooms or they eat ones that are really funky and old. And then of course they get sick. If you eat something that's rotten, it's not surprising you're gonna have diarrhea or throw up. So you wanna make sure your mushrooms are fresh. If they're past their prime or they smell bad, um, just give them a pass and don't eat them raw. Um, first of all, cause they're hard to digest when they're raw. And also, yeah, if there's germs growing on them, you're gonna kill them by cooking them. There are a couple of exceptions, but um, as a rule, do not eat wild mushrooms raw. This one here is chicken of the woods and other beginner mushrooms. It's that because it's pretty distinctive. It's bright, bright orange on the top, has like these multiple layers of shelf. And on the bottom, there are very bright yellow. You wanna harvest these when they're young as well, when they've got these bright colors and the parts that are closer to the tips they, uh, they're called chicken of the woods because they taste like chicken when they're cooked and they have as much protein as chicken. And actually most mu mushrooms are very high in protein and quite high in a lot of vitamins as well. So they're very nutritionally rich um, as well as having medicinal compounds in them. Okay, so here's another family of mushrooms called beliefs. They're one of my favorites. There are hundreds in this family, which can be frustrating for ID, but there are some simple ones there. Um, and they're just, they're just, I don't know, I just think they're really cool looking. So they have, most of them have, you know, um, caps that are very similar to gilled mushrooms, like a variety of colors and textures, but they don't have gills, they have tubes. And they usually grow from the ground. They don't usually grow from trees. So probably one of the most popular beliefs is the king belief. It's kind of like the great prize. Everyone's, you know, all very excited when they find them. And uh, they, they are found in many different countries, not just in Canada, quite common in Europe and in um, Eastern Europe. So, you know, the Russians and the Polish. Uh, it's a big tradition, right? In some cultures to go mushroom hunting. And uh, so, you know, this is the one the one <laughs> that everyone's really excited to find. It has a very rich and nutty flavor. It, it's just really good. Um, this is uh, this is me. And in southwestern Ontario, they're pretty uncommon. I've only found one and I was very excited. Um, here I am in Newfoundland on the East Coast Trail and they were everywhere. And so I was pretty excited about that. I was hiking there in September. That's when they were flushing. And they really like it there. It rains a lot and there's a lot of trees that they like to grow under. Now, one thing that people know about me um, is that I'm afraid of heights. And so this picture doesn't show it really well, but this slope was actually pretty steep. And then whoop, there was a drop down to the ocean. But I saw this huge belief there and I was just so excited. I just you know ran up to it and grabbed it. And one of my friends took my picture and then I look up the hill and I go, oh my God, it was a little bit more scary. It wasn't too dangerous, like, it's not super dangerous. I wouldn't do that, but um, that's how excited I was is that I kind of temporarily forgot I was afraid of heights. And wow, 
If anyone has not hiked the East Coast Trail in Newfoundland, I highly, highly recommend it. Now, right now we're in COVID, but when it's done, go, go, go. Um, this is something that will trick many mushroom uh, hunters. It's a bitter bolete. It can look very much like a porcini, um, but porcinis or um, king boletes have a white netting near the cap and bitter boletes, uh, the family or this, the genera is Talophilus, is Talophilus felis. It has brown netting. And another way to tell them apart is that they taste bitter. So some of you may really cringe. Um, when I first got into mushroom hunting as a hobby, my husband would freak out if I even touched one. You cannot poison yourself by touching mushrooms. You have to ingest them and a dose that is toxic. So some of the families we can um, taste and spit. Bolites are one family. I wouldn't recommend it with amantias because yeah, <laughs> they're poisonous, but um, this one you can do that. And bitter bolites, they taste bad. So it is a diagnostic test for many bolites. Painted bolites are, I would call a beginner mushroom. They're very distinct. They have this red color and then when they open up, it's sort of red and there'll be yellow spots on there as well. And the stems look like this as well. And they often have a veil that covers the pores when they're really young. They're quite tasty, either fresh or dry. They're quite common in the Muskoka area. I have never seen one of these in Southwestern Ontario where I live. Um, this is another common bolete that's pretty easy to recognize. And most Suilas, by the way, have really slimy, sticky caps, which granulated boletes do. Um, these guys, they pretty well all have yellow pores. And the granulated bolete, if you look carefully, you'll see these little black dots on the stem. These I find in Southwest Ontario. They're also very common in the Muskokas. Um, you can eat them fresh. I prefer to dry them and then I put them in um, pasta recipes um, or whatever. And as I was saying, there are hundreds of different types of beliefs. Um, there's one um, grouping called, nicknamed Scabberstock. This is their Latin name. They have bigger dots than the granulated belief all over the stem. And some of the older books say they're edible. Some of the newer books say um, they can cause tummy upsets, so eat with caution. Um, but a lot of the books say avoid, because if you're gonna have an upset tummy with these, you're gonna have a really upset tummy. I've personally never had that, but I dry them all. So I suspect maybe that's what's keeping me safe. I think when they're fresh, they're harder to digest. And maybe that's why people are getting upset stomachs. So maybe the safety thing is to dry them or maybe it's safer to avoid them. This guy here, the bicolor bolete, is not a beginner mushroom. Um, there are some look-alike ones that are poisonous. Um, I'll let you just read up about that on your own. But one rule of thumb for this whole family is if they had red pores, they're poisonous. And if they stain blue, you can see blue staining here when you touch them or when you um, scrape them with a knife or whatever, your best to avoid them. It doesn't mean that all the blue staining ones um, are poisonous. So the edible bicolor beliefs do stain blue, but until you're really knowledgeable, um, you're best to avoid that. And then this webpage is a really great resource for identifying beliefs. I'll let you just sort of explore that on your own. Okay, our next family is puffballs and some of the other associated ones. And the giant puffball is another beginner mushroom. It's the first one I would ever forage myself and eat and not be worried about poisonous um, localites because there are no poisonous localites. Now, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the pear-shaped puffballs and some of the cautions with that, um, but they're edible as well. These are cool. These are cup fungi, and I've only put a couple of common ones in here. This is a scarlet cup. And this is an orange peel fungus. Scarlet cups you'll often see in the spring. They may be some of the first mushrooms to come out and they're really pretty. I think these guys are edible. Well, I know the orange peels are edible. I'm not sure about the scarlet cups, but um, they're probably flavorless. I don't think they're poisonous. And then these are earth stars, which aren't edible, but they're just so weird and pretty at the same time. So thing, 
that really excites me about mushrooms is they're just, you know, they all look so different and they're so darn photogenic. Um, here's another um, weird mushroom. These are stink horns and um, yeah, they're very phallic in shape. Some of them have these really beautiful ways of dispersing their spores, these nets that open up. And this is another uh, really beautiful stink horn. I've never seen it. Actually, I've never seen any stink horns. And they live up to their name, apparently. They smell really bad. Okay, so this the one thing about puffballs um, that you need to do if you're thinking of eating them is you cut them in half and they must be pure white in the middle. So even the giant puffball that there's no poisonous lookalikes, if they've got green in the middle, they're past their prime, don't eat. But with the smaller ones, there's a small chance you might have picked a baby amant, amanita. I can't pronounce that today, my gosh. Um, <laughs> anyway, if it's not a puffball, you're gonna see this little baby mushroom in there and that would, that would be poisonous, that would kill you. So um, this is a death cap when it's full size and there's the young ones. And the other thing you don't wanna mistakenly think you've picked is an earth ball. So they kind of look like a football or a pigskin is their other common name on the outside. But when you cut them in the middle, they are black. So puff balls are white, earth balls are black and earth balls are poisonous. Morels, morels are a favorite with many, many mushroom hunters. Another coveted prize um, gourmet, um, gourmet cooks, of course, um, covet these as well. They have a very unique flavor. They should not be eaten raw. They are poisonous when they are raw. Um, not that they'll kill you, but you'll wish you were dead. No, right? You'll have severe gastrointestinal um, upset, and you want to make sure they're well cooked. And I can speak from experience. The first time I picked a morel, I undercooked it a bit, and I definitely had an upset stomach. Luckily, I didn't give up on them, and um, and I haven't had the problem since because I've just been more careful to cook them really, really well. And you need to know the difference between a false morel and a true morel. Now, I think they look quite different, but um, apparently people sometimes mistake them. So the way you tell them apart is a real morel is hollow in the middle, and a false morel has this solid stuff. And the reason a false morel is poisonous is when you cook them, they emit a vapor that is jet fuel chemical. And if you inhale that, it will give you liver failure over time. All right, the next grouping of mushrooms are um, chanterelles. So, you know, they're the veined mushrooms and black trumpets are in this family. Black trumpets are a favorite of mine. They are very flavorful. They have an amazing odor when you pick them. And there's no poisonous look-alike, so they're a beginner mushroom as well. Chanterelles um, are not quite a beginner mushroom. There is a poisonous look-alike called a jack-o'-lantern. And some of the ways you can tell them apart, one, chanterelles um, grow from the ground, jacks grow from trees, although they can be buried under the ground, so you have to be careful. Chants are usually bright yellow, jacks are more orange, jacks are often in clusters. And then here's the big thing. Shants have veins, like vein-like things and not really gills. And they fork and join. I don't know if you can see in that picture. And if you peel them in half, you can peel them like string cheese and they're white in the stem. Jacks don't have veins, they have gills and they don't join. And they're really thin, almost knife-like. And if you eat jack-o'-lanterns, you will be hospitalized. Again, you won't die, but you'll wish you were dead. Okay, so now we're moving on to guild mushrooms. Um, they are very, very numerous. There's over 2,000 varieties of mushrooms, not just guild mushrooms, just overall fungi in North America. So it's gonna be impossible to memorize them all unless you're a genius, which I'm definitely not. But I think, you know, we can certainly, um, learn the common ones. And then the fun thing about this hobby is you can say, well, I'll learn a couple a year, you know, keep learning. It's good for the brain. When you're looking at gilled mushrooms, you don't just want to look at the 
you know, the cap and the stem and all that, but also the how the gills look. How do they attach to the stem? Are they free where they don't touch the stem at all? Or are they attached? Do they run down the stem all the way or part way? Are they notched? That kind of thing. Because then when you go look it up in your mushroom book, um, they're going to be telling you those features. This um, picture, I just wanted to show some decurrent gills as an example. Okay, and then we start breaking them down into subcategories. So for example, um, there's a family, Russulas and Lactarius, that are brittle. When you pick them, the stems will snap like a piece of chalk, or if you were to throw them against a tree, they would just explode into a million pieces. Um, there are other mushrooms that um, don't have a cup and have a ring, um, or sorry, they have a ring but no cup, or then they have a ring and they have a cup. So you want to look for that. There are some that have a webbing rather than a ring, some of them that exude milk, which are lactarius and the broadcap mushrooms. So we'll talk about um, Ursulas first, and they come in a variety of colors. They're really pretty. And, uh, you know, so reds and whites. This one's called the short stem. The short stemmed um, Ursula, if it uh, becomes parasitized with another fungus, turns bright orange, then they are called lobster mushrooms and they are prized edible. And then they have um, a cousin called Lactarius or milky mushrooms that ooze milk or a fluid when, um, when you cut them or when you scrape the gills. So you can sort of see the milk on these gills here. It's kind of a yellowish color. This one's white. This one here is an orange milky Lactarius deliciosus and it um, oozes either an orange milk or it, it sort of bruises green, which is really cool. It is an edible mushroom. Indigo mushrooms are edible. And some of them will smell like coconut and some in this family smell like maple syrup. I talked about them earlier being candy caps and you can make cookies or ice cream out of candy caps. Okay, another um, group of or family of guild mushrooms is agaricus and we're familiar with those because we can buy them in the grocery store as button mushrooms, portobellos and creminis. And they are found in the wild as well. So an example would be horse mushrooms or field mushrooms. And some of the agaricus in the wild are edible and some of them are not. So an example is what's nicknamed the yellow stainer, stains yellow, sort of self-explanatory. And so um, if you accidentally pick this, you will be doing this, spending quite a bit of time in the bathroom. And they have a really foul smell as well as a clue. Okay, these mushrooms here are um, honey mushrooms. They're very common in the fall and they tend to be very prolific, which means that, you know, large bunches of them, they grow from dead logs. And they're not quite a beginner mushroom. There is a poisonous lookalike called deadly gallerina. So you need to know the difference. And this is where a spore print will save you. So gallerina has a brown spore print. Honey mushrooms have a white spore print. And honey mushrooms have these little hairs on the cap. And, you know, the centers of them when you look at them from above, you know, they're sort of darker in the middle and less dark around the outside. So those are identifying features. Whereas Gallerina is more a, you know, uniform brown on the cap. And then you, if you look carefully, there's this little fine ring there, or sometimes it's a, a ring remnant that's brown. And they tend to have more brown gills. Um, honeys will be more whitish. And honey mushrooms are related to shiitake mushrooms that you can buy in the grocery store. Just a little FYI. Now, one reason that honey mushrooms are really famous is because of Paul. He discovered that um, honey mushrooms, there's one in Oregon that is one of the world's biggest living things. It has uh, mycelia that extend for over 2,200 acres and it's over 1,500 years old. And this picture is just showing mycelium. So they're the root structure 
that's under the mushroom. And what's really cool about mycelium is that apparently trees communicate with each other using mycelium. So, I mean, I love trees. Who doesn't love trees? And the fact that they actually communicate makes them even more amazing. Makes me want to run out and hug one like right now. Okay. So this family is Amanitas and uh, they are, I think they are very beautiful. Um, there are a lot of them that are really poisonous and they're quite photogenic. This one here is a, a destroying angel. This one's very famous Mario mushroom. Um, yeah. Another group of guild mushrooms are called, uh, I nicknamed them quartz, quartinarius, and they, are, uh, they have a cortina which is a spider-like webbing that you find. Uh, they used to have you know, a veil that protected the gills and then the veil sort of breaks and then you have the cortina that's left. So you wanna look when you're picking mushrooms at the gills and look very carefully, are there any little threads attached to the margins of the cap that would tell you that it's a cortinarius because um, most in this family are poisonous. So just avoid them all. And then the broad caps. And an example would be the parasol. And you have to be careful with this. There's a poisonous lookalike called a fair, false parasol. And they have different color spore prints. So that's how you tell them apart. This one here is another example of a broad cap. And there's quite a few in this family. And your mushrooms would be another one, Cluteus. Um, yeah, I'm not really familiar with a lot in this family. Okay, poisonous mushrooms. There aren't really that many that will kill you dead. So I think it's just important to learn the kill you dead ones. You know, the Amanitas, um, there are some of these funnel caps, fiber caps, and uh, Portinarius. And of course, uh, I talked about Gallerina that are very, very poisonous. And if you eat them, um, you'll either go into kidney failure or liver failure. And um, the chance of surviving that is really low. So we'll talk about some of the most poisonous ones, Amanitas. They have a very particular toxin that, um, that causes liver failure. And the symptoms start with a tummy upset and then people think they're better. And then in about four days they're in liver failure and it can be irreversible. So it's really important that if you eat, I mean, obviously don't eat these guys, but if you eat any mushroom and you think that you got poison, you need to go seek medical care immediately because there's a chance they can save you if they get to, to it right away. Uh, otherwise you're screwed. So I can't stress that enough. This one's a death cap. So the thing about Amanitas, so they have an annulus, they have a bulb. Um, and then if you look at the death cap, it has sort of a greenish tinge to the cap as contrasted to the destroying angel which is pure white, hence the name angel. And then this one's a panther cap, which is brown with these little spots. And a lot of Amanitas have these little spots on them. Now, you may have heard of people on the West Coast getting poisoned with death cap because they thought they were these uh, straw mushrooms. And it's commonly people from Asia because um, straw mushrooms are very uh, popular in Asia, and you can kind of see how they kind of look similar. So they would come to Canada and they would see death caps and go, oh, there's straw mushrooms, and they would pick and eat them. And the moral of the story is just because something's safe in your country doesn't mean that something that looks similar in another country is safe. And it's also, <laughs> we have to be careful when we, I mean, I'm using common names here, which a true mycologist would beat me with a wet noodle over and over again for doing that because um, there are nicknames in one country that are very different in another country. So Latin names are the same in every country. Um, to be accurate, we really should be using Latin names. One reason I don't is right now there's a lot of DNA studies going on. And so mushrooms are just constantly being reclassified. And I will learn one name. And then two years later, they've changed it. Um, an example of that is the pheasant back mushroom. You would have maybe noticed on that slide I had two names on there because yeah, Polysporus formosus was the old name and it's got a new name now. 
Okay, so these guys are fun. These are fly agaric right here. This is the variety that's most common on the West Coast. And on the East Coast, we more commonly have this yellowish variety, the Formosa variety. And um, they are magic mushrooms. But they're not the same as syllabin mushrooms, which are pretty well found on the West and East Coast. These are not found in Canada, not this variety anyway. Um, I don't recommend um, eating these for recreational purposes because, well, for one, there's a toxin in them, uh, muscarinic acid that um, will make your heart race and they'll salivate and uh, be really nauseous and throw up and probably be hospitalized. So I guess people who are into this recreationally know how to process it to reduce the toxins and make them more safe. Um, uh, I'm not into that, so I really don't know what they're doing or how they do that, but I guess knock yourself out if you wanted to Google it. Um, some people will eat these. I'm not that brave. And what they do, because this, tox this toxin, not, not that toxin, this toxin is water soluble, is if you parboil it and discard the water and you do that several times, then you, you eliminate the toxin and then you can um, fry these up and eat them. They're no longer hallucinogenic or make you sick. Um, again, I'm not that brave. I think there's too many other edible mushrooms. I'm like, why bother? Um, Gallerina talked about, this is what they look like. And there's a couple of variety. Well, there's lots of Gallerinas, but these are the two more common poisonous ones, Marginata and Autumnalis. And uh, you can see, right? They, they kind of look like honey mushrooms. Um, brown spore print, white spore print. Just be careful. And sometimes you'll have them both on the same log. So if you're picking honey mushrooms, you just want to go through them one by one and make sure that you don't have some gallerinas mixed up in there. That would be bad because even one of these um, will put you into kidney failure. And then we talked about web caps, right? So a lot of them are poisonous, fiber caps and false parasols and jack-o'-lanterns, of course. Don't mix them up with chanterelles. Brick tops are a common edible mushroom. They kind of have a greenish um, gill. And then they have a cousin called the sulfur tuft who looks almost the same, except the caps are yellow instead of brick like. So I don't consider brick tops a beginner mushroom. And um, yeah, you would not want to eat sulfur tusk. Um, I think they cause severe, severe gastrointestinal upset. Okay, and then finally, edible mushrooms. We touched on a few. So, you know, we talked about morels, we talked about bolites, we talked about chicken of the woods and chanterelles. Um, Swiss is in the bolete family, white pine bolites, of course, honeys. I didn't talk about hen of the woods. So I'll let you just read up on that on your own. Um, I'm not really familiar with Lacari at all, so I can't comment. There is one, or there are one or two edible corals. Um, even the edibles can cause tummy upsets if they're not well cooked. And uh, there's just so many lookalites for me, I just avoid them. Bear's head tooth is really um, cool. It has some medicinal properties too. It's been shown to slow the onset of Alzheimer's and stimulate nerve growth in people. And there are clinical trials with that. So it's not just uh, witch doctory. Uh, that's really cool. And when these guys are cooked, they taste like crab which is pretty amazing. And then um, oyster mushrooms, you know, you can buy those in the um, grocery store. Um, they are quite common. They, they bloom in the summer and they bloom in the fall. There's different varieties. I'll uh, let you read up on those on your own. Okay, so here's some um, resources um, that you can read on your own. So I've just put a couple of my favorite ones on here. And then I've just listed some of my favorite um, Facebook groups. And I just want to warn you that there are trolls on Facebook um, who will sometimes tell you that something is edible or they'll put a false ID. And I don't think that's funny because if someone was to take it seriously and consume that mushroom, they could die. Um, I just, I don't understand it, but anyway, I have seen it. So just be very, very careful. I wanna plug the MST. I'm a member of this and not during COVID, but when um, it's safe again, they have forays um, every weekend during mushroom season, and they're very knowledgeable people in this club that will go out with you and help you. 
and they even have a weekend every September where you spend a whole mushroom, a whole weekend mushroom hunting, and they even hire experts to come and help you with ID. Um, if you're into YouTube, there's lots of good stuff there, but really there's only one God, <laughs> and that's Adam. He is extremely knowledgeable. His channel is amazing. Um, he looks so young, and, and then he starts talking, and I go, oh my God. I don't know if he's reading from cue cards or, or whether he's just so brilliant, he has all this stuff memorized, but check him out. Amazing, amazing young fellow. Um, it's all relative, right? Um, young compared to me. Okay, so I love this saying, if in doubt, throw it out. Like if you don't know 100% the idea of a mushroom, please don't eat it, that's just crazy. Start with the beginner mushrooms. And then because some people are allergic to mushrooms, you wanna just try a teaspoon the first time and wait 24 hours. Um, keep your mushrooms in a paper bag and keep them in the fridge and they'll usually keep them two days. And then just uh, wait 24 hours. And then if you're not sick, then you can probably cook up the rest. Okay, and then go foraging with experienced people because a lot of this is show and tell. You know, you can't, it's hard to learn from books and even pictures on Facebook. It's better to, to go with someone who knows their stuff. Um, someone who's very knowledgeable in the Stratford area is a gentleman called Peter and his business is uh, Pucks Plenty. I've gone on a few of his um, outings and uh, he's a lot of fun and very knowledgeable as well. And this saying is true, there are old and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old and bold mushroom hunters. All right, so thank you very much. I hope you 